Okay, so this is the Nixie tube clock I just finished. Uses four Nixie tubes. Uh, also uses, uh, I think it's 36 driver transistors and eight ICs. It runs directly off of rectified mains and there's a voltage doubler to give 350 volts for the tubes. The ICs are CMOS 4000 series logic. Um, there's one 4013 flip-flop and the rest are 4017 decade counters. Uh, this one, I believe, does a divide by, t by 6 and then a divide by 10, then a divide by 60, and so on and so forth to give uh, minutes, tens of minutes, hours, tens of hours. And the way this works is that um, it derives its it derives its signal from the 60 hertz mains. So how about I just plug this in? So the thing about this is that it it, it can power up in real weird states. It didn't do it just now, but what can happen is that if you turn it on sometimes, different uh, multiple segments can come on at the same time. Well, I guess it's just not doing that today. I can set it. Yeah, the solder joint came loose on this, so I have to fix that. Okay, so another weird thing about this clock, um, basically, uh, the first time after you push the button, um, this is a fast scroll, and this is a, there's basically two buttons right here. This one is a fast set, and this is a slow set. And basically what they do is they short circuit some of the divider chips so that a higher frequency goes into the clock. And so basically another weird thing about this clock is that based on when you release this button, the first minute might be shorter than it's supposed to be. Like if you hold this and you say let it go at the wrong point, like a but like the first minute can be like 30 seconds off. So that's what makes setting this clock really hard. I'm pretty sure there's a modification but I haven't really looked into it yet. So basically how this works is that the chip right here, the 4013, serves two purposes. One of them is to add as a buffer for the mains because it gets its trigger signal uh, from a 2 mega ohm resistor from the live to the input of the chip. And then I think this divides it by 6 to give, uh, to give 10 hertz. And then this divides it by 10 to give 1 hertz. And then uh, divide by uh, divide by 6 and then 10. So that's 60 in total to give minutes. And then another divide by 10 to give tens of minutes. And then another divide by 6 to give... Uh, uh, I don't know what it's called, tens of minutes again, and then a divide by 10 to give hours, and then, I, I can't remember, but then another chip to make this turn on and off when it hits 12. Now, the thing that really got me messed up on this is, well, first, when I first plugged it in, the one of the voltage doubler diodes was shorted and uh, this huge plume of smoke just poured out of this thing and filled up my room and that was that was unpleasant at least the lights didn't go out though so um 
how I was running this for a while was I had my vacuum tube power supply running the tubes, and then I had a 6-volt battery running the logic chips. Oh, yeah, and the way the logic chips are powered is that there's a two 100k ohm resistors from the live going to, in, to a zener, and that gives a 5 volts for the chips. And these chips can run anywhere from 5 to 16 volts, so that really doesn't matter much. But, uh, so, basically, another one of the things is that if you look at the time, it progresses really weird. Uh, just watch it. We'll go 9, 10, 11, 12, and then back to 1, and then 2, 3. And what this clock was first doing when I first built it was it was going... Uh, it was going 9, 10, 11, 12, and then 3, 4, 5. So it would go 1, it would go 11, 12, and then 3. So basically that meant that one of the chips wasn't resetting pop properly, and that was solved by, I think, adding a capacitor to the right place. And also swapping a few chips around. Uh, I was lucky enough to get a huge bunch of chips to try out with this because my school just has a bunch of logic chips laying around. So, and then after I fixed that, then there was another problem where it would go one, two, one, two. And that also meant that the chips weren't resetting properly, but I fixed that when I got a different logic chip. So basically how I made this was in the Mike Harrison plans, basically you can uh, print out a PCB and etch it yourself, but I don't have the ability to do that. So what I did was I use perf board if I don't shock myself. And you can see I basically used speaker wire to hook everything up. And I, then I used enameled copper wire for the tube pins. Um, yeah, if you're not uh, if you're not experienced with soldering onto tube pins, I do not recommend this because if you uh, apply too much heat, you will crack the glass. So let's look at the underside. The underside, I have to admit, did not turn out too well. Um, I think I had to use one eighth of an inch solder because I didn't have anything else in a 100 watt soldering iron. Just because I didn't have the right tools available to me. And you can see the IC connections and then all the transistors. And here are the anode resistors for the tubes. When I first hooked this up, I had only one anode resistor for all of them. And then what would happen is when the other digits would come on, they would dim. And actually it got so bad that when all of these were lit and then this one came on, the other ones would go out because the voltage drop was so large across the resistor. So it really is required to have individual resistors for each one. So I, I really hope that wasn't as boring as I thought it was. But that's my Nixie tube clock. I built it over, I think, about three weeks. That, took, that, that was how long it took for me to get the parts to solder everything and to troubleshoot it. I think I was lucky on this though. Troubleshooting only took, I think, about a day or so. So I will have all the plants you need to build one of these your own in the description box. Stuff like that. Also a link to Mike Harrison's YouTube channel. So, thanks a lot for watching. See you later.